I feel like I've been in this situation many times addressing a group of people about a subject that I'm deeply passionate or concerned about. This is different tonight. There is a weight of children that are going to be affected by what goes on in here tonight. And this project is P2I. And it's critically important that I transmit to you the, the chance that we have to create an incredible difference in the world. So the project is called P2I, which is basically a project of safe pregnancies and healthy babies. It's to prevent serious problems with children. I represent the forum, which is the organizing group uh, behind this. I'm going to start with a, a parable. Uh, there once was a village overlooking a beautiful river. The residents who lived there began noticing increasing numbers of drowning children caught in the river's swift current, and so went to work inventing even more elaborate techniques to resuscitate them. So preoccupied were these heroic villagers with rescue and treatment that they never thought to look upstream to see who was pushing the victims in. Tonight we're going to talk about traveling up that river to see who's pushing those children in and how to stop it. The project again will uh, be this weekend a CME course which will be tomorrow and we're very pleased at the faculty that has agreed to do this historic course. Uh, this is also going to be part of a virtual campus and we expect two to three million people a year to visit the campus and thousands of doctors to take this CME course. And uh, we chose the faculty uh, carefully by starting with Dr. Bob Hendren, who put this group together, and we are deeply grateful, Dr. Hendren. When we started this project, one of our board members, Dr. or David Chapalye, said, I'm not going to be part of this if this is an academic pursuit. I'm not going to do a science project. I want a goal that you commit to, to get my support. You know what that was, David, because we've been haunted by it. Five years from the start, which is today, the goal of this is to have one million families affected by this program. One million families with safe pregnancies and healthy children. And that is a goal that we're committed to and it's a goal we're going to achieve. We start with something that's been in the news that all of us have been aware of, and that's the rise in autism rates. The current numbers are one in 68, but this is for 10 year olds. This is how long it takes to get them diagnosed and count them up. If the rate of autism continues to increase at this rate. It means that a child born today, today, in 2015 or 14, the rate will be 1 in 18. Maybe 1 in 25, maybe 1 in 30, but this is an unacceptable number. And this is a number which, to this date, we've been keeping track of, but we've not had a plan to say, we're going to reverse those numbers. But it's not just autism. Let's take a look at the numbers nationwide. Most people will be absolutely shocked at this slide. Miscarriage rate in this country is 31%. Half of those people are not even aware they've had a miscarriage. 31%. The preterm birth rate has stayed at 12%. But look at the other rates, whether it's autism, asthma, allergic eczema, serious food allergies, celiac disease, ADHD, dyspraxia, which is spastic type behavior, Bipolar disorders, childhood obesity, uh, these are shocking numbers and they're all going up. So that the closest figure that we can approximate is that by the age of 16, we're going to have close to 40% of the children will have a chronic condition they will not likely recover from. In China, the number is closer to 50%. Again, people are living with these tragedies inside their own homes, not recognizing that we are living in a calamity. We are watching these kids, trying to treat them and resuscitate them, and we're not going upstream. Simple as that. 
So let's take a look at the, the, the nature of where these categories are coming from. On the left column, we're dealing with prototypical infections, and, and these were the ones that I grew up with, the rheumatic fever, hepatitis A, tuberculosis, mumps and measles. And look at the incredible job we've done taking these episodal illnesses and conditions and reducing them to a very manageable level in the United States. But now look at the other column. As we've had these conditions go down and we've built a medical system around it, we have seen an explosion in immune disorders. And they have names multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, autism, ADD, type 1 diabetes, and asthma. They're all connected. They're not separate in terms of their causation. There was an incredibly interesting study that was done by the uh, Environmental Working Group. And, and Lee and I know Tim Cook, who is the founder of that fine group. And what they did is they decided that they would test the umbilical core blood of infants. Before that time, it was thought that the toxicity that mothers were having in their blood never really got to the infants because it was a safe place. It was protected. How that was thought when we had existing smoking information and studies that were based on metals and toxins going to the fetus, I don't know why that was never quite put together, but it was the case. But what the Environmental Working Group found was nothing short of shocking. Of the 287 chemicals they detected in the umbilical core blood of these infants, which is about the same uh, dose that was in mothers that they found, they found that 180 cause cancer in humans, 217 are toxic to the brain and nervous systems, 208 cause birth defects and abnormal developmental tests. Uh, so <clears throat> the fact is that these illnesses create a $500 million burden on the economy. Pediatrics came up with a, an incredibly interesting issue April 25th of 2011. There was no publicity on it outside of this was being sent to every pediatrician in the country. It showed that we're in serious trouble because these toxins confirmed by the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics with the help of the incredible work that's been done by the CDC indicated that we have polluted the wombs of all of the pregnant women, probably 95%. And the call to action was not that the doctors start to counsel parents about it. It was that it was a call to the government to do something about it. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? The National Institute of Environmental Health said that children's health research is a priority for the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The environmental plays a role, and this is worth pausing on. The environment plays a role in 85% of all the diseases. The new science is showing that the effects of exposure to chemicals at low doses and in combination can have an impact on human growth and development. What we're looking at is this is not a genetic-based theory of disease. It's being replaced by an environmental impact. And we just had an incredible, for those that were at the meeting at 4 o'clock talking about the research, I think you all sat there and say, what the heck? Because that figure of 85% was wrong. The figure was 90%. Right, Frank? 90% of all of the conditions that our chronic disease are caused by primarily environmental impact. They may have a genetic connection to them, but what we're looking at doing is we can prevent these. And of course, that's exactly what this conclusion begs for. Well, let's talk about something that most people think, well, the babies come a little bit early. Dr. Cordero has done a lifetime of work with the March of Dimes and other institutions working brilliantly with, with preterm. And this is part of the reason why. The 520,000 are the number if you multiply the rate by 12%. That makes it a lot more real, right? 520,000 children. The IQ is 8.2 lower in those preterm children. It costs $26 billion a year for that cost, which is $50,000 a child. They also have 10 times the learning disorders and 80 times the cerebral palsy. And what we're saying here tonight is that's not necessary. These kinds of rates of preterm children are not necessary. It's not part of a condition that should continue.
Let's just take one simple thing about the environmental impact, something that a lot of women do during pregnancy without thinking at all about it. They drink diet soda. If they drink diet soda, and a very good controlled study uh, in uh, uh, Denmark, one can increase the preterm rates by 18%. Now let's go up to four cans of diet soda a day. The aspartame increased the risk 72%. Who in their right mind would drink four cans of diet soda per day knowing this? Who would? What doctors are talking about it? We are. We are here tonight and we're announcing that this is going to be part of the initiative of being able to let people know there's an environmental component to what's happening. So the figure of preterm births again, 50,000. I don't mean to just talk about financial, but a lot of people when they look at placing where the donation should go are looking for a social impact and a value to their money. This is it. This is absolutely the best possible investment that people can make. Because with a child, we're protecting 80 years of living. Let's talk about the financial impact to self-insured corporations. Most people would be surprised that 62% of all the Americans don't have health insurance. They're insured with the corporations they work for. What is the single largest cost to those corporations? It's maternity costs with complications of pregnancy. It's more than heart conditions and cancer. We can't have a system that spends as much on children as we do aging adults and have a surviving and thriving economy. Okay, is this just something that we've cooked up or is this something that has come to the attention of top people in the medical profession? Uh, Dr. Perrin uh, is now president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, but he wrote in the conclusion to a wonderful article in the Journal of American Medical Association, this commentary provides sobering information on major increases in chronic health conditions, especially obesity, asthma, ADHD among U.S. children and youth. Of course, it's also global. Especially reflecting fundamental changes in the environments of growing children, health and social welfare systems are unprepared for the rapid growth and demands that will arise from these epidemics. This is not some alternative medicine guy. This is the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Right, Margaret? We know Dr. Perrin, and, and he's passionate about it. And, and we had conversations, and he said, what, what can we do? How do we change the behaviors of people? You inform them of these things, and their behavior will change. And that's what P2I is about. $500 billion on the cost for childhood chronic diseases is not the measurement. We should be talking about the misery that it causes. And many of them in our own lives, in our personal lives, understand that with our own children and grandchildren. But the $500 billion is about the cost of Social Security. You can't run an economy when you're paying this much money for chronic diseases and taking 40% of the children putting a handicap. Uh, part of this is we're not just here to describe a problem, we're here to try to fix something. The forum has had a great history with the Northwest Autism Foundation in tackling some very, very difficult problems. And one of the first projects we did 10 years ago was the ATN Network. And it uh, went over to Autism Speaks and was responsible for $70 million in NIH funding. And it was to go ahead and design medical protocols for autism. There was one person who I would consider to be far and away the hero uh, of that. And we're greatly honored to have her with us tonight. She chaired this organization. And I was telling her as I saw her, I think of her often, Dr. Margaret Bowman. Dr. Bowman ran the powerful Harvard Ladders program and did breathtaking work in combining behavioral training with medical uh, treatment. And she is what I would call somebody who can connect future dots. She can see things that nobody else can see. And it's, again, it's a pleasure. Uh, we also published uh, works in pediatrics, taking gastrointestinal. And the way we've done this, and John Nahoney, our executive director, who's here, a brilliant job, we got 26 of the top scientists in the world together. Right, John? They worked six months before they got together. 
So that meant when we got them together, there was a power of convening them together because they had something to say, right? They had something to say. And they voted with electronic voting on if they disagreed, they would tell that to the person presenting the paper. And we had medical writers there at the time. This paper, when it was finally done, was 83 pages in pediatrics, and they didn't change a word. It created gastrointestinal treatment centers all around the world for autism. That was what was done by Northwest Autism in the form. We have the ability to do projects like this. Uh, Lee Grossman and I, uh, working with the encouragement of the form, uh, connected autism to the environment in 2006. And Lee pioneered this in the Autism Society of America. And Lee, I think, is the same thing. Nobody at that time had any connection between the two. Now it's, it's commonplace. Uh, one of the things that we did when we started ATN was I was at the dinner with uh, Dr. Harlan Winter and he said, I don't know if I can do this press conference because nobody accepts that autism is a medical condition. It'll take us 10 years to get this across and have this accepted. And it was Richard Fade, who was the number two guy at Microsoft, said, how long will it take Harlan if we don't do it? And he said, don't wimp out on the vision. Simply manage the expectations. Tell people this will take time, but if we don't begin the journey, it's not going to happen. Almost 10 years, Margaret, to the date, Dr. Perrin now, through dumb luck, who was part of the ATN project, became head of the AAP and published all of the ATN articles establishing autism as a medical condition and got insurance in 26 states. It was almost exactly early, 10 years to the date. The work's obviously not done, but the goals were met. So what we're going to talk about with some of you at 9 o'clock on a strategic meeting is how do we build and globalize this project? How do we attack it? And this is the matrix. It's what needs to be done. We have to have a strategic alliance that re requires a movement. To do this, we have to have a plan. The plan requires a vision. The vision requires leadership. And then we have these incredible campuses to communicate. And we'll get into this more because I don't want to go into this right now. Uh, this was the matrix that we used from Els Culver, who at the age of 65 years old, when many people decided to retire, founded Mercy Corps. And at 68, that organization was $1 billion and in 75 countries. This was L's formula, and he sat and worked this out as an advisor to us. And uh, very grateful. This is the second part about it, the components that we need for it. And it's the research, information, education, resource development, fundraising, advocacy, and care and training. It's one thing to describe a problem. It's another thing to solve it, right? It's the equivalent of if somebody were outside of your home, shivering in the very cold weather, and you walked outside, John, and it said, you know where that cold wind is coming from? Let me explain the meteorology of the, the weather from the Arctic. And you explain everything about how the cold takes place, and you walk back in your house. They need a coat. <laughs> That's it. They need a coat. Okay, so part of this is we describe a problem, but we also look at solving it. We also put the mechanism in place and to bring movements into place. I, I was fortunate enough to work with Ralph Nader, and he was very insistent that it's not enough to describe a problem. We have to go ahead and, and drill down, work till midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning to solve a problem. I'm going to talk, and I think this is a very important slide because this summarizes what we talked about. In order to change behavior, you have to have measurements. I went into the doctor's office a couple of years ago, and the doctor said, how are you feeling, Dave? I said, I, said, I feel fine. How's your blood pressure now? Well, I think it's normal, 120 over 80. So he said, let's, let's take it. So I took the blood pressure as 170 over 120. That stopped the negotiation. That stopped the denial. <laughs> Uh, my blood pressure was high. I should have knew it was high. So the idea is that this project will allow us to measure women's toxicity burden before the pregnancy occurs. They will know exactly the body burden that they face. We had a very good person that we know in New York. She has a $150 million organic food company. She has a child with autism while eating perfect organic food. But when tested right after the pregnancy, her metals level of mercury and lead were completely off the charts. She did not know that eating sushi 
created a mercury problem for her newborn. She did not know that the lead soldering in her pipes created the problem of lead in her system that went right to the fetus and interfered with the development. Did these two things cause the autism? We don't know. But I guarantee you that if she would have known that, she would have changed her behavior. That's what measurement does. That's what measurement does. Those two problems could have very easily been corrected. So exposome is a measurement. The exposome can be defined as the measure of all the exposures of an individual in a lifetime and how those exposures relate to health. And this is right from a CDC document that goes on to say, one of the promises of the Human Genome Project was that it could revolutionize our understanding of the underlying causes of disease and aid in the development of prevention and cures for more to suit. That's what about everybody thinks here, right? The Genome Project. Now, unfortunately, and again, this is the CDC document, this is not Dave Humphrey. Unfortunately, genetics has been found to account for only about 10% of the diseases, and the remaining causes appear to be from environmental causes. Is that absolutely stunning? Did we all think that cancers came from just bad luck? So to understand the cause and eventually the prevention of disease, eventually the prevention of disease, environmental causes need to be studied, and that is the science of exposome. Frank, was that an exciting tech meeting today? No. Talking to the person at Agilent and hearing the comments from Dr. Cadero, that we can not only tell a woman what toxicity is occurring in her system, but how that toxicity is impacting the fetus and what diseases will be caused from it, predicting leukemia before it happens so it doesn't have to happen. Cancer is the second leading cause of death for children before the age of five years old. Seven years ago, I was in Mayo Clinic in the radiation department. I had cancer. I was not given much of a chance to live. What impacted me was I was sitting there with the pediatric children coming in, sitting with me, waiting for their turn. And as I didn't have the energy or the enthusiasm to get the juice, they would bring it to me and people like me, four and five years old with cancer. So when I look at this, I go back to those times. These are exposures that they didn't buy into. I bought into mine. They didn't buy into theirs. The American Academy of Medicine concluded that the risk is appreciable that the current patchwork system, even with the challenges, changes in recent legislation and progress in the private sector, will simply collapse under its own weight. What they are talking about is the medical profession needs to take leadership in prevention. And to do that, they have to bring in the other 17 million health care workers. What they don't say here is they need to bring the public in. Because the public, when they hear this information of what they can do, will follow it. But they need leadership, and they need leadership from the medical profession. And we're very grateful for the cooperation and leadership that we've had from all of the medical associations for the CME course. Uh, you'll hear tomorrow from one of the most incredible doctors in the country, Dr. David Berger, who will talk about a practice that has been dedicated to protect his clients from environmental risks. And the result is an unbelievable record in pregnancy safety and virtually no children with any toxic or environmental conditions in its practice. Uh, I won't go into the foresight study. There was a 1990 where they took 367 couples and they took the toxins and great nutritional food and look at the results. Virtually no miscarriages, stillbirths, malformations. It was heavily criticized. It was not very well done. But it was an indication in 1990 that something was happening. I think some of the most outstanding work you'll hear tomorrow for the doctors is the, the work that has been sponsored by the Moore Foundation. Uh, Bob Moore, Bob's Red Mill, uh, made a tremendous donation to the University of uh, OHSU. It's a fetal origin theory, which basically said that if a child is not given proper nutrition during the pregnancy period, it can alter the genetic expression, causing obesity, cancer, and heart disease. Now get this that not just lasts for that child's lifetime, but lasts for four generations. This is not alternative medicine. There is no alternative biochemistry. To have a revolutionary 
program, we need a revolutionary vehicle. This is the environment that we're talking about. It's a 3D virtual training world. It's like you immerse yourself on the internet into game technology. You can go to the conference, you can listen to the speakers who are going to be hearing tomorrow, and, and a feeling like you're right there. You can go to doctor buildings and select doctors that have taken CME courses. You can go to forums and talk to people all around the world. It's revolutionary technology. And the person who is responsible for it is sitting right here in this room, senior executive of West that has generously devoted his time. He does these for IBM and most of the pharma industry. And there is no finer person that we have associated with us than Steve Malthill. Thank you, Steve. Take a look at the snapshots of the campus. Uh, it will be, again, like you're an avatar in Second Life. And this will give the public, and how many people a day can go to this? 150,000 people a day. This is revolutionary technology. The campus will be a circular campus. You can go in there and take a monorail around it and see what's on the campus first. The conference will be designed to engage people in a global discussion. Let me repeat that again. It will engage the public in a global discussion because who is not interested in what I'm talking about tonight? We have this arrogance, I think, that the public's got to be protected from these things. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. People will be able to take interactive books, fill out information, guide by guide, find out if that type of lipstick that they're using contains lead or not. How cool is that? Doctors will not have to spend hours with patients because they refer them right to the website. And this interactive website can tell them all they know about how to go ahead day by day, step by step. One million safe pregnancies and healthy children. I want to transfer some of the burden that I feel to you tonight because this is not my project. This is your project. Thank you.